County Manager, Bishop Boyce, friends, um, I'm very pleased to be here this evening. It's very hard for me to refuse an invitation to McGill because my uh, grandfather was born near Ardra and my grandmother was born in Buncrana. And I have, a, a, as part of my record now, my criminal record, the fact that I lived in a place called Chur. Chur, some of you may know where Chur is, many of you may not. But it's part of my criminal record because um, uh, one of the things that I have to do uh, is to get a guard of vetting before visiting schools. And I had to fill in everywhere I lived from the time I was born. And my form was sent back to me by a very uh, precise Garda who said, I didn't give the street address in Chur in which I lived. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear that those who know where Chur is have understood. <laughs> the second thing I would say is, uh, for those who don't know Chur, there are three houses. Uh, the second thing is why I couldn't... Um, say no to the invitation is Joe Mulholland. Joe has a remarkable ability to convoke and I think this, this uh, session shows really how remarkable that ability is. And I was delighted to be present when Joe was uh, installed as Donegal Man of the Year earlier this year in Dublin. <laughs> I was struck by a phrase of Franklin D. Roosevelt, which Joe quoted in the programme of introduction to this year's McGill's Summer School. Some of you may remember it. It said, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 30s said, We've always known that heedless self-interest was bad morals. We now know that it is bad economics. And Joe's conclusion is that while FDR realized the truth of that phrase in 1936. Today, we can all join in chorus and say, don't we just know it today? My problem is that I'm not so sure that as yet we have fully understood the phrase uh, of, of Franklin Roosevelt and what it really means. I suppose it goes back to my natural suspicion, maybe from my Donegal origins, but to my, also my diplomatic training, that I have a particular disquiet about adjectives. So the first word that I began to look at in FDR's phrase was the word heedless. Now we'd all immediately agree that we're against heedless self-interest and that heedless self-interest is immoral. But what do we mean by heedless? And when you want to find out what a word means, it's useful at times to look at what would be the opposite of heedless self-interest. There are those who would say that enlightened self-interest is not just acceptable, but in the long term is an attitude which is favourable towards and vital for economic growth and the generation of wealth. But again, I'd begin to say what sort of package of enlightenment would be at the basis of such an affirmation. Certainly, enlightened self-interest is a strong motivating factor which gives human creativity and innovation a particular edge. And today we particularly need, in a knowledge-based economy, human creativity and innovation. But I believe the fundamental question we should be asking is, is self really the dominant notion on which to base our motivation for action in the economic sphere. The economy has a social function. Catholic social teaching defends the right to private property and always has, but also asserts that all property is subject to a social mortgage to a sense of social responsibility. I saw that dynamic play out in an earlier incarnation in the World Trade Organization debates surrounding intellectual property rights and access to medicines for HIV AIDS. And I wouldn't exclude we might see the same debate about 
the response to the swine flu virus. Protection of intellectual property rights encourages research, but we always have to remember that that search belongs within the broader responsibility for protecting health globally. And the ownership of knowledge also bears a social mortgage. So self-interest alone, no matter how enlightened, cannot be the sole measure for evaluating relations within a society and today within a global world. The fact of mutual interdependence, which is the essential starting place of globalization, mutual interdependence, means that no individual, no individual business enterprise, no individual country, no individual sector group in society can go it alone. In today's world, the concepts of entitlement and self-interest, and indeed of group interest or sectoral interest, with whatever adjective you may like to add to it, they have to be twinned with the concept of solidarity, which defines what I would call the responsibility side of the equation regarding the economy. And as we look at the current economic situation on the national and global level, I believe that we have to generate new parameters for defining that twinning process between economic growth and solidarity. Our economy needs to balance its books and to do so in a sustainable way. But that sustainability will be determined not simply by cutting back on spending and getting the sums right, but by optimizing all spending in such a way that the overall objectives of an economy at the service of society can be realized. Cutbacks should never lose sight of the long-term objective to be achieved. And to do this, I think we have to redefine that word heedless and more closely identify the factors, human, economic and social, to which we should be paying heed. On many occasions, I've stressed my conviction that Ireland today urgently needs a poverty strategy. Now, a poverty strategy is not a luxury for times of prosperity, but it is absolutely essential in the leaner years. By a poverty strategy, I do not mean simply providing essential social security, much less do I mean handouts. By a poverty strategy, I mean attention on assuring that in the lean years, human potential and talent are fostered, and that a response to disadvantage in realizing such talent be prioritized. A poverty strategy in times of cutbacks then has to look differently at investment in education, has to look differently in fighting disadvantage, and look at it with lenses which do not just focus on the broad percentage cutbacks across the board. Even in times of tightening up, I believe that there are areas where the wide focus lens is the only appropriate one. But let me come back to FDR's affirmation that heedless self-interest was bad morals. The second word in that phrase, which I felt needed closer examination, was morals. The term morals is a word open to many interpretations, more so than ever today when on a global level or within our own country, there is no longer a fundamental agreement on where morality is founded, and thus where pragmatism and utilitarianism and indeed self-interest can come quickly to dominate our thoughts. Morality in business. For many, morality in business is about not breaking the norms of fair competition, honesty and transparency, and not being involved in deceit and corruption. Now that's a job description phrased very much in the negative terms of not breaking. But I have to say, would that we would even be there. For others, morality in business would focus on respect for the protagonists of economic activity, 
namely people with their rights and their entitlements. And there are others who would stress that morals means delivering to the shareholder, but remembering that the shareholder may not just be the speculator or the professional investor, but maybe people's life savings or investment to guarantee pensions or even the production of social goods such as medicine and health care. Again, we see there again a recognition of the fact that an economy always has a social function which needs to be heeded. Morals are not primarily about immorality. The moralist is not primarily the one who criticizes, who points the finger, who judges others, very often sitting in a comfortable armchair on the sidelines, observing and judging those who have to make daily and very difficult decisions. In the past, it was ecclesiastics who took with gusto to moralizing in that sense. Today, we've been joined and maybe even superseded by a wide range of secular pundits and moralists. Morals must be rescued from such negativity and move towards what I call a morality of proposing, a morality of setting out indications and frameworks in which the moral imperatives about the good and the truth in society can be marked out and then translated into practice. In this context, I'd like to pay tribute to John Hume this evening, in whose honour this annual lecture is held. Someone who in the midst of the crisis of society in Northern Ireland of the late 60s and the years that followed, had the clarity and determination to identify the things to be criticised and rejected, but who never lost sight of the underlying forward-looking vision of a different Northern Ireland, a different Ireland, a different relationship with Ireland's neighbour and with Ireland's European roots and hopes. And we thank you for that. <laughs> In facing the problems of our economy today, we have to learn from that experience that the only solution is one that looks also at the long-term solution. Pragmatic decisions have to be taken day by day, but they will never be truly pragmatic without, to quote another US president, the vision thing. What went wrong with the Irish economy? There's an abundance of analysis and there is abundant attribution of blame, of short-sightedness, of heedlessness, and there's ample space for the old-fashioned negative moralizing of which I've spoken. But to answer the second question posed to this summer school, how will we fix it? We need much more that morality of proposing. We need much more the sense of vision. What is the contribution to this fixing process? Not just of the extraordinary pool of technical talent and wisdom that will be gathered here this week, but also of morals. What sort of ethical framework might be needed to ensure that we can truly and sustainably fix it? What are the fundamental moral choices that have to be made? What sort of society do we need to foster? And again, what sort of people must we be in order to achieve this? You can see these are not simply technical questions. Indeed, I would immediately take task with the term fix it, which is written behind me. I believe that for far too long now in Irish politics, we've lived in a fix it mode. And that perhaps today, the day has come for one of those occasional quantitative and qualitative leaps which have also characterized the history of Irish politics. I believe the challenge today is not just to fix it, but to change it, and to change our ways of carrying out politics, and to change ourselves as individuals and as a society. A climate of uprightness can only be generated by people who are upright. I quote from the latest encyclical of Pope Benedict when he was talking about development, but we could apply it to ourselves. Development is impossible 
without upright men and women, without financiers and politics whose consciences are finely attuned to the common good. Pope Benedict in his first encyclical stressed surprise some by stating that it is not the task of the church to build a just society, but that is the task of politics. He said, building a just and civil order uh, wherein each person receives what is his or our due is an essential task for every generation. As a political task, this cannot be the church's immediate responsibility. Or again, the church cannot and must not take upon herself the political battle to bring about the most just society possible. She cannot and must not replace the state. And at the same time, she cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. A just society must be the achievement of politics and not the church. Many are surprised by that. Yet, he said, the promotion of justice through efforts to bring about openness of minds and will to the demands of the common good is something which concerns the church deeply. At a moment in, when there is a certain disillusionment with politics, when right across Europe many young people do not even vote, I think the Pope's endorsement of the centrality of politics is quite striking. And when I speak of a qualitative leap in Irish politics, I must be the first to say that part of any qualitative change must involve the relationship between church and state, between church and politics in a changing Ireland. There are many aspects of the relationship between church and state in Ireland, which are, as I said recently in the debate about schools, part of a hangover of our particular historical past. Now, when I speak of the changing role of the church, I wouldn't want to give the impression that it's all about being more compliant and more tolerant towards today's thought processes. I'm not giving, as some would claim, a sort of blessing to a more secular Ireland. And strangely, nowhere more than in Ireland does secularism paradoxically like to be blessed. Nor am I favouring the more radical response of those who would tell me, thanks for coming, now you can go off back to Drumcondra, back to your sacristies, back to your own historical past, and keep your historical hangovers out of our lives. The Church has to move away from any temptation to maintain an attitude of dominance. But no one wants a Church which would just give a moral veneer to the ways of society. The church has its mission. The church's mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that gospel is not the gospel of a comfort zone. And I would say also that many sectors of secular Ireland also have to find new ways of addressing their own historical hangovers about faith and learn to relate in an adult way with the place of religious belief in society. A vital democracy must find ways in which the values, including the religious values of all, are welcomed and cherished. Now you might think I've drifted off on a tangent away from the theme of this summer school about the Irish economy. But I believe that the idea of moving from the hangovers of our historical past regarding the role of the church may illustrate some areas of reflection on a new vision of the economy and politics in Ireland. Certainly a situation in which the church took over or was handed over day-to-day -day responsibility for the running of most of the school system or our hospitals was and still is an anomaly. But the answer, I believe, is not simply handing over everything to state bureaucracies whose efficiency has certainly yet to be proven. And in case, some cases, efficiency may not be the word even to apply. In his latest encyclical, Pope Benedict talked about cross-fertilization between different types of business activity, 
with shifting of competences from the non-profit world to the profit world and vice versa, from the public world to that of civil society, from advanced economies to developed economies. Market economies can be used to deliver social goods effectively and a non-profit model can provide services in a more efficient way than business or the state. And underlying that, those insights of Pope Benedict's encyclical is an application of the principle of subsidiarity to a modern economy and the creation of a model of government and economy with much wider participation of intermediary subjects. A state which simply delegates a wide part of its social responsibilities to a church had gotten it wrong. And a state which takes over the entire package is on an equally dodgy ground. Monopolies of ideas can be as dangerous as monopolies in the business sector. And the result could easily be a society which becomes passive. And in that sense, impoverished and even less a less free society. I quote the words of a 1972 anti-conformist Italian songwriter who I know quite well, Giorgio Gaber, and would be, if he were still alive, would be very surprised to be quoted by a churchman when he said, la libertà è partecipazione, freedom is participation. Ireland needs today not just a revival of social partnership, but an even wider model of social participation. Civil society is not a totally separate third force, distinct from the state and the market. Civil society is not a cheap alternative or a fire brigade for social emergencies. Civil societies, society and the values which are characteristic of it should, can also be seen as a protagonist for the economy, both in terms of the goods and services it can provide, but also as regards the basic inspiration and value system which it has, particularly because it has a different view of profit. There are various types of business enterprise which simply do not fit into the traditional clear distinction between private and public. There are economic actors of various types, which again, to quote Pope Benedict, without rejecting profit, aim at a higher goal than the mere logic of the exchange of equivalence of profit as an aim in itself. And in this, there's this fundamental Christian concept of gratuitousness. Gratuitousness, which is the essential antidote to consumerism and narrow market-focused mentality. What does gratuitous mean? It means that as a person, I can and I must offer my neighbour not just goods and services, but something of myself. It's a concept which, if embraced, will inevitably lead to a new way of understanding business, since investment has always a moral as well as an economic significance. Economic growth and solidarity are not two parallel separate blocks. For Pope Benedict in the encyclical, he says, solidarity and reciprocity can be conducted within economic activity and not only outside it or after it. But for this vision to work, we need more than ever today real political leadership. Political leadership at a local, at a national and an international level. And this is essential, it, it is needed especially in the light of the processes of globalization. Without clear political leadership, the current economic crisis and the challenges of globalization might even undermine some of the foundations of democracy. Political leaders need to show us the way. The current economic crisis poses a real challenge to government institutions. After years of calling for small government, many of the more strident proponents of small government 
are looking to government to bail them out. And ordinary citizens are angry. Government must take its share of responsibility. Many organs of government and financial regulation, national and international, watched by, and I come back to the words of FDR, heedlessly, as the evident signs of heedless self-interest flourished and grew. And indeed, the organs of civil society and the intermediate groups, including many aspects of the media, joined in the heedless euphoria of recent years. Solidarity is not a luxury addition to the way society works. In poorer times, it was the basic network of community solidarity which kept society together and enabled people to, people to hope. I remember on the street where I lived, the first time somebody died. It was an amazing thing. The neighbours moved in. Uh, everything was looked after. The widow was looked after, the children were taken, they were fed, they were nourished, and it lasted for days. Nobody asked them to do it, nobody had a plan to do it, it just happened. And that's the way that this is what gratuitousness means. Whatever happens on the political level, that sense of true community solidarity will remain necessary, indeed even more necessary, in the years to come. We need a strong civil society. We need a strong sense of neighbourliness and community. There's no long-term real answer, for example, to that challenge of violence, which I see on the streets of Dublin. It's frightening. The only real long-term solution is a vibrant community spirit which takes a stand. We need a new culture of participation. Political institutions and political parties have to come to the forefront of fostering a true sense of community participation and allowing true ownership of social policy. The media have a special responsibility to bring abuses of power and trust to light, but the media must also be on the side of an ethics of proposing, of constructive support for those who are out there day after day facing the frontline risks of attempting to change society. And I say that as one who believes that the media and civil society are essential for Irish, to Irish politics and the economy. We talk, began talking about heedlessness. We need more people who heed, who heed not just their own interest, but that of society, and who are prepared to stand up and get involved. We should not fall into the unrealistic dream that we can fix it from the outside. There's no way to address the future of the Irish economy and of Irish society which does not involve a real politics of participation. My role as a bishop is not to propose how to address the economic challenges of cutbacks but to witness to the message of a God who reveals that he is a God of love, who reveals that in Jesus Christ, who reveals that he is a God whose inner life is sharing and who reaches out in love. And my job is to encourage the followers of Jesus Christ to do likewise. I thank you.